hardcore boxing fans out there, how are you doing? It's Big Porky here, the voice of hardcore boxing. Today I'm joined by Sheffield boxing man, ex-professional fighter and current trainer, Richard Towers. How are you doing, Richard? Are you all right? Yes, Russ. All good. All good over here, pal. Still alive, still kicking. Yeah. I like your uh, hearts, what you've got. Where you get that from? Thank you, pal. It's uh, uh, you were a present of mine from um, from Cash. Yeah. It's a 13th century Ottoman Empire hat. Ottoman Empire. Oh, right. Worn, worn by Ertugul, Ertugul Ghazi. Is that what Cash told you? <laughs> One of the most ferocious warriors known to human yeah? existence. Is it? Yep. He's trying is to that, tell me something. Is that him on your WhatsApp profile, him? Yeah, that was that was him. I've took it off now. It's, it's, I think I've got my lads on there now. It's a bit deep, that, isn't it? <laughs> when I see yeah, it, I'm like... Deep. That's, that's me, Russ. I'm deep, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how many fighters are you training at the moment, Richard? Uh, I've got um, I've got about eight amateurs, uh, really, really good amateurs. Yeah. Um, and then I've got Cash Alley and I've got Chris Latekia, who's hopefully going in um, Olympic qualifiers in the next few months. So uh, oh, we'll yeah. see about that. Anyway, yeah. And obviously, obviously, he's going to go pro with you if he turns pro. Then. Yeah, well, that's the plan. He's uh, he's obviously just learning. He's only had thirty amateur fights. He's uh, eight times um, regional champion and five times national champion. And um, and he's got a lot. Of, he's been. He's got a lot of bad habits. He's been allowed to um, fester in his bad habits, and probably, but only boxing at a certain level, and um, and 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 just being allowed to get away with what what he won't get away with in yeah. uh, the the pro professional uh, pugilist category. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's definitely showing improvement, and. And it's I, I don't you know me, Russ. I don't only work on the the physical side of it. I work on the mental side of it more than anything. Yeah. And um, and that's just simply simply because I know how how um, you know the ratio of 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 the physical aspect in comparison to the mental aspect. The 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 mental aspect far outweighs the physical. You know, so um, I work on that a lot with kids. And especially the kids what what uh, uh, have got experience, but also the kids what haven't got experience, because I think it takes a certain type of human being, never mind a coach or trainer, to to train a kid. And um, and I like to think I'm one of those uh, cut from a similar type of cloth to Brendan, but only time will tell, pal. You know, I can't I can't compare myself to Brendan Ingle at all, which I'm not trying to do, just yeah. out of respect and love for my dear friend. But um, that's what I aspire to achieve. You know, I've got kids in the gym now. Uh, they've been with me for four or five years and they're, they're showing immense, immense improvements for us. So, only, like I say, only time will tell, pal. Yeah. Uh, let's, but let's back up a little bit then, because obviously you started out at the Ingle gym, didn't you? Back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what sort of characters were in that gym back in the day when you started out? Uh, they were they were junior junior were WBC champion when I first got there. Um, Witter. They were uh, Kel weren't there when I first went. He, he he came along shortly after. He came back to to Brendan's gym after um, leaving to train with Dave Coldwell. Yeah. Um, they were they were um, obviously me and me and Barry Kid Galahad started at the same time. Um, there was Johnny used to train quite regular then. Um, Buster were training. You know, I was sparring. I was sparring with Buster quite a lot. Buster, Buster taught me a lot. You know, with regards Buster to Buster Keaton. Yeah, Buster Keaton, John John Keaton. Yeah, um, Buster taught me a hell of a lot. Um, and 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 there were a few others, you know, coming through. But there were a fella called um, fella called. M- Musson, I think he got locked up for rape. I think. Oh God! <laughs> you know oh, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we'll not go too deep yeah. into that, yeah. that 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 character. But he, you know, yeah, they were um, they were a good few, good few, um, good few good fighters there, and and like I say, it were it, I was just thrown in 
thrown in at the deep end because from the from the get go, I think for after four weeks of training or something like that, five weeks, I might be wrong, but I, I was sparring with Tyson Fury. Well, my version of sparring, I'm sure he'd, he'd laugh at that um, quote, you know, because. I weren't. I didn't have much to offer in a uh, a boxing experience sense, but um, I had balls. I were I were ready to get in there, and, you know, and and mix it up and try me hardest at the with the very limited knowledge that I had. So I, I was in at the deep end from from start, and then it weren't long after that I went to spar with Vladimir. I went to spar with John McDermott, um, who, I, who I completely played with. Just a. Um, you know, not not a very nice character. I've heard he's 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 been he was slagging me off not long after the fat con. Fuck him anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, squeeze that one out, Russ. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then uh, uh, a fella called Dave Dolan. I sparred with Dave Dolan. Um, he came down. Sam Sexton. Uh, a good few, good few. I think I sparred with Danny Williams years ago. Uh, it's part with a good few of them, and David like I say, with, you know, sorry, pal. David A. Yeah, David A. Spot, spot with all of them, Russ. I, I've, uh, I've lost count of how many people I sparred with. Yeah. I just spar with everybody. You know, oh, Carl Baker were there when I first went. The fridge. The yeah, fridge. Carl were there. <laughs> yeah, the human <laughs> fridge. <laughs> um, but, but like I say, Russ, you know, um, it's funny because. When I first got out, I had no idea whatsoever about anything to do with boxing, you know. But um, I was, I was, I was in full respect of of fighters just after a few weeks of training, realizing that these these guys have been doing that for years, or they would have had to do it for years to get anywhere significant. So I had a, I had a lot of respect, you know, coming through, and and not to mention I was at the side of my beautiful dear friend Brendan, and. Um, and I, I, what I didn't realise is how much gardening and digging of trees I'd have to do and picking litter up all the way along Carlisle Street and back. <laughs> is it is it true that Brendan used to have... Well, I know it is because... So, so, so I'll, I'll rephrase the question. Did How did you feel about Brendan having you walking up Newman Road all and you? You know, sometimes when you thought you'd be training and you'd be clearing all rubbish up and that, what did you think? Is he crazy or something like that? Uh, well, I, I were a little bit. Um, I, I suppose I were a little bit more mature in comparison to younger kids like Barry uh, and a few other kids, Sam or Mason. Uh, I was probably a little bit more mature than them in my mindset. Uh, obviously, being a little bit older, but uh, I was just I was just happy to be out. And Russ, I don't know if you remember me telling you why I got into it, Jim, uh, but but I was just glad to <laughs> glad to be. Um, yeah, yeah. Off the off the probation's uh, radar because yeah. they were looking they were looking to throw me back in at any time and um, obviously me getting out and and um, and getting getting into a fight the day that I got out weren't going to look good on me my probation report so uh, I'd gone into Brendan's gym to try and just do something productive and kind of selfish really because I thought I've got to put my mind into something because. I'm clearly, I'm clearly not right, you know. Yeah. Because um, I, 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 I'm not going to lie, I, I did try and hurt, hurt the fella, and I did hurt the fella, but um, I just realised that I, I had to just put me, my mind into things, and I still do it today, Russ, because yeah. not, not long since you phoned, somebody's getting on my nerves, do you know. I won't say any names because you'd know what yeah. I'm, I'm on about, yeah. but I just think to myself, I think these people are so foolish. Because he said, like, Russ, in, in the past, I've had people stand in front of me and, and I'm, I'm nobody. I treat everybody with respect. I don't, yeah. I don't uh, put my weight about Russ. I don't, you know, unless, unless it's a twat, then yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll let twats know that the twats and whatever else, whatever, whatever um, type of people fit into the twat category, um, I don't mind putting my weight on them. I don't mind, you know, making them feel uncomfortable. But I'm talking about people in general. I'm a nice person, Russ. I treat people with respect. You know I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but every now and again, you bump into somebody that they've, they've got a different idea of things until until it comes to a uh, till it comes to a head. And then next thing, they either get you locked up or they're telling everybody, are you crazy? And, you know, you've done this and done that. It's always been the same, Russ. And now, I just, you know, there's people aren't road where I am, you know, 
uh, down in Hillsborough, you know, I, I I bump into people, you know, people that see me on a regular basis, like, why would you ever look at me and think to start something? Why wouldn't you just look at me and just, if especially if I'm I'm looking and I'll usually let on to people, Russ, I'll be like, hey, how you doing? You all, you all right? And I get people like, they'll just look at me as if to say, fuck off, you know, soft cunt, because I've said hello. Yeah. And then jump running, jumping forward, uh, a few minutes or whatever to where uh, it's come to a head and I've maybe responded or reacted to their disrespect, all of a sudden, you know, there's fucking screaming and, and claiming the victim. And it's always been the same, Russ, and this yeah. is one of the predominant things for me, uh, especially in boxing, Russ. Um, if, if, somebody's, if somebody's nice, just be nice. Because uh, if not, if you want to be... Um, uh, are wrong enough. You want to be nasty, or you want to be. There's, there's, there's always somebody out there to challenge you. There's always somebody out there. What's tougher? What's harder? What's braver? What's got more money than you? You know. So you can always get a challenge if you want it. I just can't understand the people that call on the challenge, Russ. Then when it comes to it, they're writing fucking statements. Out. Do you feel that? Uh, I don't like to bring this up, but we obviously you were in, you were pretty big on drug scene back in the day, weren't you? You were doing your thing, weren't you? You got 13 years, didn't you? Do you feel yeah. that that's always going to follow you around? Because obviously you got 13 years for violence and it was all drug related, but in that world, if people take a liberty, you don't think about, you look at them as the same as you, don't you? Like you would in a ring with a boxer, don't you? Do you feel that that's always going to follow you around, what, what you did to them who, who stole off you? Uh, yeah, yeah. To be honest with you, Russ. To be honest with you, like I still get it today. You know, uh, I look on. I just have a look on comments and stuff like that on you know interviews. What I, what I've done, and you've always got a little weasel because if you know, I'm, admittedly so, I've clicked on the the uh, profile you know before now a few times in my time, and and you look at them and you think, how can this little fucking weasel be be um be trying to provoke something out of me, little fucking rat. And they'll, they'll say something, they'll say something like, um, yeah, fucking kidnapper, kidnapping and scorching and electrocuting people and this and that. I weren't, Russ, I weren't, I weren't convicted of torturing anybody. Oh, I'm, not, okay. I'm not saying it for them, those people's purpose. I'm yeah. saying it because my co-defendant, who I didn't really know, I got introduced to him. We'd already spoke previous to the, the the actual kidnapping. Yeah, I did. I did commit the kidnap. I did, you know, go and grab the fella, put put him over my shoulder, put him in boot, lock him in boot, tie him up. I did do all that, uh, and I'm not justifying or or glorifying anything because I'm. It's one of the biggest regrets I've got, Russ, is hurting people. But yeah. when it what we'd agreed, me and my co-defendant was. Don't hurt him. You don't need to hurt him. No matter what, do not hurt this kid. And he was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. I won't, I won't, I won't. And don't hurt the kid. You don't need to hurt him. Tell him to fake it. Tell him to fake down phone so we can get ransom money. And that's it. And he was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Obviously, when I've left, because it weren't in Sheffield where the, the safe house was, yeah. when I'd left, um, unbeknownst to me, he was actually torturing him. He electrocuted him. Broke his hands, broke his feet, um, cut him, burnt him with me with a burnt him with an iron, you know. But I didn't do any of that, Russ. So when I'm looking on these comments and I see people go, "Yeah, fucking iron torture, he's electrocuted people, and this and that, he's he's burnt people." It's it's just another another version of a fanny talking shit. Excuse my yeah. language, Russ. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. And you just uh, think, to, yeah. you know, yeah. Sorry, pal. No, I'm gonna say. Uh... Obviously, people are trying to just hype the story. Apparently, add their bit on, aren't they? Yeah, definitely, Russ. And that—that's it. That's always it. But one of one of the things that you're always you're always gonna fall um, susceptible to. Sorry, you're always gonna fall open to is um, is being you know of put of the of a public opinion. Everybody's got their own. Um, everybody's got their own opinions. Everybody's got their idea of. Uh, what they think is right and what they think is wrong, and when you're when you put yourself into boxing, into professional boxing, you're open to scrutiny, Russ. Yeah. So, and that's one of the things I didn't really realise, you know. And one of the things that 
I reiterate to kids and I'll explain to them, I'll say, listen, this is how it's going to be. And I put them under immense pressure, Russ. You you know, you've been to the gym and you've yeah, seen yeah. how this, you've heard how my own kids speak. And I know that it's, I know that a lot of the time, you know, it's, it's very difficult to deal with. But one of the things that I never, ever realised would be such a challenge was, was the amount of pressure I got publicly. Just from, you know, Russ, I, I, I had 16 fights. I'm not 13 out of 16 out. Um, I won a version at European title. You know, I'm fresh out of jail at 27 years old. I didn't have my first fight till 29 years old, Russ. Um, and you'd think that you'd think people would look at these things and 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 say, "Oh, yeah, well, fair play to the fella," but they don't, Russ. What they do is, you know, you're not. I'm knocking everybody out, not in like um, Tyson Fury or Anthony Joshua or even Dillian or Deontay fashion, nothing like that. Um, but but I was getting rid of the guys. I was getting rid of opponents that were stood in front of me. Yeah. I didn't know about building fights up. I didn't know about you know first getting used to people with losing records and then eventually building it up, which every single fighter does, Russ. Yeah. I didn't know about that. So I was just, I was knocking people out what was stood in front of me, Russ. Um, and not necessarily in a very um, educated boxing fashion, but I was doing my job nonetheless. And the amount of people that I had patting me on back, people coming with sponsors, people coming with, you know, everything you know, to lay down rose petals in front of me to walk on pavement. That's where, that's where it's easy to fall victim to, like I said, Russ, being open to scrutiny. It's easy to fall victim because it's very difficult when, you know, everybody's singing your praises, everybody's patting you back, everybody's shaking your hand, everybody's speaking so well of you. Then one day, Russ, you have a, you have a fight with a guy in Gregory Tony. Gregory Tony had, he'd had 20 years boxing as a professional um, K1 fighter. So he'd got a lot of combat experience. Then when I fought him, he'd had 17 professional fights. He'd won 16, lost one, and knocked 14 out. So I were, I were always in above me head, Russ. But people don't look at that because I got in there and I didn't realise what he was doing. He was hustling me. You saw the fight, Russ. He hustled me. Yeah. Um, and and then I still he gave up in ninth round because I just kept going and kept going and kept going and kept going. It didn't look the neatest, it didn't look the best. But you know, people are like, oh yeah, well this this guy's gonna do nothing. And as quick as as quick as you know, I'd I'd got ten or twelve fights out of the way and knocked everybody out. As quick as I'd progressed like that, Russ, people were as quick to ridicule me and put me down and you know. From it, from it, from it to the fire. You won that um, fight though, didn't you? I won it, but you won't think so, Russ. And then what they did, somebody on somebody on YouTube took all my fights down, Russ. I had 13 out of 16 <coughs> knockouts. They took every one of my fights off and left the the Gregory the fifth round of the Gregory Tony fight, which was terrible, but that was my learning experience. They left that on there and the Lucas Brown farce what I, I didn't turn up. I weren't myself, Russ. And fine line between reason and excuse. But I, I, I boxed terrible, Russ. But that's where I was learning. Yeah. Um. And and it's it's a shame that 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 this is how boxing is, and this is how boxing is definitely going. You know, Johnny Nelson, um, in particular. Um, I watched an interview where he's digging into Deontay. And, and, you know, when I see Johnny, I'll speak to him about it. You know, if, if Johnny's watching this, Johnny, Johnny knows me. I'm straightforward. Um, and I'll speak to him about it. If you don't want to speak about it, no problem. We'll, we'll, we'll speak in another way, no problem. But, you know, I'm, 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 I'm Russ, you know. I'm, I, saw, I'm, I saw that interview. I, I knew when you saw that, you wouldn't be happy about what he said, like, about it. Because he's your pal, Deontay, isn't he? Yeah, but, well, the thing, is, the thing is, Russ, the thing is, I'm just going to say this. And if Johnny, if Johnny, if you're listening... What I don't, what I didn't really appreciate, and you might not give a fuck, but neither do I. I don't give a fuck either. And and you know, I talk to you when I see you, no problem. But in fact, I'll come and see you, no problem. Just you know, I'll come and see you, no problem. But um, I just think to myself, you know, Johnny, I, I had a lot of respect for Johnny because Johnny coming up, coming through, um, 
he told me how difficult it was. Brendan used to tell me how difficult Johnny had it because Johnny had a fight with a fella called Carlos de Leon. Yeah. So my understanding of it, what which Johnny's given me and Brendan's given me, I've I've seen the fight, but you know, their their words were gospel to me back then. Yeah. Um basically Johnny was an absolute laughing stock in Sheffield. He he said to me, he goes, Richard, he goes, I felt like killing myself at one point. He goes, cause you know, I walk in with my missus, he goes, and people would be shouting, Johnny, you useless black bastard, you, you, you're this and you're that, and you're no good as a fighter and this and that. He goes, Richard, he goes, and I remember having these conversations, heartfelt conversation, so I thought, and Johnny sat down telling me about, oh, yeah, Richard, I, I, I went through this and I went through that and this happened and that happened. And and I was like, flipping at this guy, man, has been through hell and back. And he's still here. He's still defended his title. Still, uh, you know, uh, reigned for what something like seven years. And you know, you've got to take, you've got to give the guy respect. And then yeah. I heard how we were digging into Deontay, and I thought, this guy's doing what was done to him. This guy's this guy's doing worse than what was done to him. Because yeah. Deont- and Deont- I'm not saying Deontay's done himself any favors. He hasn't done himself any favors. And I've spoke to Deontay about it. I've said to him, D. You know, don't be saying that and don't be saying this. But he's not going to listen to me. Who the fuck am I, Russ? Yeah. So he's not going to listen to me. So I understand that he's he's not done himself any favours. But people might have said the same thing about Johnny Nelson years ago, that he'd not done himself any favours. And I know what and I know what everybody in Sheffield's like. You know, um, you know uh, Dominic might hear this. Uh, uh, Johnny might hear this. Other people might hear it and they'll go, oh, yeah, uh, Richard's pissed off with you. I'm not pissed off with you because if I was pissed off with you, I'd have been fucking, I'd been at your fucking doorstep. Simple as that. But <laughs> I'm, not pissed, I'm, not, I'm not pissed off with you. I'm just disappointed. I'm just mm. disappointed that, you know, a man what's been through such fucking ridicule and such a bad time in boxing, that being Johnny Nelson, mm. so it fit to sit and, you know, dig a guy out and, you know, they don't know where Deontay's been. They don't know where he's been, but I thought, I just thought, John, I thought that Johnny might have had a little bit of, bit more respect just off the back of me, Russ, but clearly not. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, I, I'll speak to him about it, but if you don't want to speak about it, no problem. But it's the same old story, isn't it, Russ? Same old yeah. story. People, people um, light me fire. They light me fire and then something happens and then I'm the bad one. And what they do is they get me locked up with no hesitation, Russ. And you can see, I can go into one no problem, Russ, because I've got that side to me. And yeah. it's a side that it's a side that Dominic understands. It's a side that um, Barry understands of me. And, and if I'm honest, Russ, you know, I get on with Dominic. I get on with Barry. Um, but we've got an understanding. They don't want me around them too much because I'm an unpredictable character. They're the types of characters, they'll upset people. They'll upset people and they always will upset people in little ways here and there. I'm not on about Barry, yeah. because me and Barry are different. I'm on about Dominic, I'm on about Johnny, I'm on about certain, you know, uh, mature figures in boxing, experienced figures in boxing. They'll, they'll, they'll upset people and they don't understand the implications of, of the possibilities or what could happen. Now, yeah. Until it does, until it until it does happen, Russ, and then all of a sudden, everyone wants to phone police, or everyone wants to, you know, play the victim, or or be the type of person that, yeah. you know, I don't ever cause trouble with nobody and this and that. I just yeah. think, I just think it's not very nice, Russ, and being not me saying it's not very nice, that's an understatement. It's fucking disgusting when you know uh, certain people have been through certain things, yeah. and Deontay, like I said to you, you know, I could t- I could tell you, Russ. You know, I, I've I've not spoke to Deontay in a while. He don't he don't answer me calls a lot of time anymore. I don't yeah. speak to Deontay on a regular regular basis anymore. But it's the principle of the thing. I'm no I'm no saint, Russ. Yeah. But but one thing I'm not is I'm not a fucking hypocrite. And if yeah. I've been through certain things, like if I've been through I've been through jail, a lot of jail. I did a lot of segregation. Um, and and if if I see someone what's a fucking what's lost the marbles because of uh, as a result of doing a lot of say, lot of jail or a lot of whatever, I sympathise with them. 
I don't sit throwing stones at them or spitting on them, saying, oh, you crazy motherfucker, because I know exactly what they've been through, Russ. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Were Paper Lackey in jail with you? Uh, yeah, he weren't, he weren't in jail with me, Russ, but he were in jail at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the purple one. <laughs> Did Fuck you know. <laughs> oh, people keep saying to you, why don't you get Purple Aki on the show? <laughs> He's locked up, isn't he? <laughs> I don't know. It depends what you want to talk about, though, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, backing up a little bit, then. Obviously, you've been around some legendary trainers, Brendan Ingle. Yeah. Uh, Vladimir Klitschko's trainer, Manuel Stewart, the late Emmanuel. Uh, yeah. One of the greatest of all time, isn't it? Brendan Emmanuel, yeah. Adam Booth, and who's the, other, who's the other trainer you've been around? You've been uh, yeah. Jonathan, Jonathan Banks, was it? Oh, Jonathan, yeah, Jonathan, yeah. yeah. Dominic. I, I think when I, when I was around Jonathan, though, he weren't, he weren't really a, a coach. He, <laughs> he weren't really a trainer. He was just... Um, he was just uh, he was just ticking over as a part time professional. Like he won, he had a few fights um, lined up, I think, and he was training with Emmanuel. And then I remember that Emmanuel didn't really um, talk, speak to Jonathan Banks. And then I heard an interview of Jonathan saying, uh, "Yeah, man, Emmanuel's um, put me onto this and put me onto that." I was like, "We didn't." I remember Emmanuel saying. He didn't, he didn't. He didn't speak to Jonathan Banks, so I didn't. It didn't really make sense. But I'm not trying to expose anybody. Jonathan's a good guy, but um, but I think, um, like I say, Russ, you know, the reality and the re- reality in comparison to the the myth mm. is always a, um, a a big distance in boxing. Um, and I'm I'm just I'm not interested in getting caught caught up with anybody. Or anything in boxing, and I know what I know what's going to happen, Russ. I know what's going to happen yeah. with me. They'll they'll not nobody will give me um, a fair shout. I won't get you know um, to go on and do interviews, you know, like uh, sat aside of Dave Caldwell or sat aside of uh, Adam Booth or sat aside of um, um, any uh, Johnny Nelson. You know, I know they won't get that because one of the things what what I realise, Russ, is. People, people, are a little bit paranoid of me. They're a little bit paranoid of me, so they show up all smiley and this and that, but they do little things behind scenes to try and stunt, stunt me growth or try and stunt me way forward. Now, people will be watching this for some of the guys. He's, he's, he's not right. I mean, Ed, probably right, but they'll be going, oh, he's, he's, uh, he's paranoid and this and that. Nah, not at all. Brendan used to say the same thing. He said, when I first start, when I first got on with we, we training, Richard, we, we coaching fighters, he goes, everybody was laughing at me. He goes, they'd laugh at me. He goes, the same people today, he goes, I see these people and they'll go, Brendan, how are you doing, Brendan? My good friend. He goes, and I just sit, sit and I think I remember in, in the 70s, 80s, he goes, they'd sit and they'd go, Fucking Paddy's here again. He goes, he's a laughing stock. He's got this little Arab kid with a big nose and big ears. He keeps saying he's gonna win British, Commonwealth, European, and world title, and he's gonna he's gonna earn forty or four hundred million um pounds. Fucking crazy. I remember Brendan saying that about people, and I've actually sat with people still in boxing today. I'll mention no names that Brendan save the fucking skin save the job Ross they won't be in the position they're in and they're in a very predominant position in the British Board of Boxing Control and I've seen those same people Brendan told me about these people he took it he, he goes I saved his bacon Richard I looked after the fella I helped him Alma helped him we all helped him and it come to him helping me and they don't want to know fight Fights, they 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 rob them at rob them amateurs. They rob pros. They do all sorts of things. I'm I'm starting to sound a bit bitter, Russ, and I don't. No, you're not, mate. Talk. You're not. But not, but mate. what what one of the things that I am, Russ, is I'm not. I don't fan it. I'm not. I'm not a bullshitter. Um, I don't. I don't pitter pat around people. You know, on eggshells and all that. You know, if I've got something on my mind, I'll speak about it. Do you know what I mean? And. If if and I'm one of them, Russ. I won't say anything bad about you behind your back because if I did say something about you, you can guarantee that 
there's going to come a time I'm going to say the exact same thing to your face because it's just how I am, Russ. Yeah. So, and I know I've got it all to come. I've got it all to come, Russ. So I'm just happy training the kids, training the pros, training all kids what I'm training and coaching. I'm just happy doing what I'm doing, Russ. I'm not getting any money for it. That's not what I'm doing it for. I'm doing it to to help help human beings become the best they can be. And it's working up to now, Russ. So I'm, I'm happy in what I'm doing. You know, if, if a wolf wants to come and knock on my door, it's leaving skinned. It's leaving <laughs> with no fucking fur on it. Simple as that. Just leave me. I just want to be left alone, Russ. Yeah. Simple as that. Uh, moving on then. You've obviously took, took something out of all these trainers that you've been involved in over years. You've took something from each trainer. I'm not going to say is Brendan better than Emmanuel or, or, or Adam Boo and, and Dominic, things like that, because every trainer brings something different. That we, we both know that, don't we? But have you took yeah. a lot of wisdom from all these trainers that you've been around and put it into into mix for you for for you to move forward? Yeah, I can I can definitely say that you know I've um, with, with Brendan, um, I can tell you the the particular things the things that I've took from him. With, what I took from Brendan was the humanitarian side. I took Brendan's, you know, his his passion, his compassion to to like I said, develop people that had been pushed by the waist, put by the wayside. You know, nobody else wanted to know about them. Nobody else were interested in them. Brendan tells me a story about a fella called Herbie Hyde, mm. and he said, at the time when Herbie Hyde was training with Brendan, he goes, we had a um, Excuse me, Russ. Yeah. We had Herbie Her- Hyde coming down to the gym and this and that. He had a stutter. Yeah. So when Herbie Hyde would speak, he'd go, Brendan, Brendan. He couldn't. He had a really bad stutter. I'm probably not doing a good um, yeah, impersonation yeah. of it, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So he said, he said, I always had the ability to help people with regards to behavioural issues and stuff like that. He goes, because I was one of those kids, he goes, I was troubled in school and he used to tell then tell me about school days and this and that and he goes, but I could fight. He goes, because my, my family were known for being able to fight in, in Ireland, in, in Dublin. He goes, and um, he goes, so all the kids knew that, you know, one, a few kids in particular, if I wanted my own work doing, they won't be getting bullied. They do me homework because I weren't the best reader or writer. He said so. Um, um, sorry, Russ, my battery no went. My battery no thing came on there. Can you hear me, Russ? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, so, so with with Brendan, what Brendan told me is he said he goes Herbie eyed. He goes, I'm always good with behavioural problem, you know, candidates type thing. He goes so. Um, Herbie eyed, he was stuttering, stuttering, stuttering. He goes, and I just got the thought one day, I'm going to get this fella doing a bit of work, see if that helps him. I'm going to get this fella doing some public speaking, see if that helps him. I'm going to get this fella doing somersaults, doing rolls in ring. He goes, see if that, he goes, I were always just trying different things. He goes, then one day, he goes, a friend of mine asked me to do some housework for him. So I said to him, I've got a really, really big, strong black fellow who comes down to the gym to train with me. He's called Herbie Hoyd. Am I all right to, to bring him to help with the... I think they were doing some painting and decorating or something like that, Russ. So his friend agreed. He goes, so we went round to the house. He goes, and I remember uh, my pal had a, a really beautiful daughter. He said, so we went into house. He goes, and Herbie introduced himself... Uh, uh, my, my name's Herb, 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 Herbie. He goes, and he introduced himself. So Brendan said to his friend, he went, where's your daughter? So he went, oh, she's upstairs, Bren. So we shouted her. He said, when she walked down the stairs, it was like one of those movies where the, the damsel in distress walks down the stairs and soft music playing and that type of thing, slow motion. He goes, and she walked downstairs. He goes, Herbie looked upstairs and went, Hello, my name's Herbie. Nice to meet you. He goes, and I thought the tricky bastard's not stuttering anymore. <laughs> 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 so just just little stories like that, 
Yeah. I used to get so much from Rust, and um, and 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 that's not just it's not just a fluke. It's not just a a, a jokey story. That's yeah. a serious thing. Brendan should have been paid millions for the job he did with all the human beings, all the children he had from from day dot all the way through. Brendan should have been paid millions, and he weren't. You know, um, and that's that's the that's probably the the uh, wretched side of boxing or the wretched people in boxing. Brendan didn't get his full dues. And Brendan always was, he said, I lived a great life, Richard. I've had a great life. I've had a brilliant time. All my kids, Dominic, Brendan, John, Tara, Bridget, they're all doing well in life, Richard. He goes, and I'm satisfied with that. He goes, I know that I could have done more as a dad. I know that I could have been there more as a dad. He goes, buddy, I weren't the best at that. He goes, so what I tried to do is create something that we could all be involved with. For years, Dominic weren't interested in being, being involved in gym. John wrote, John always had a good brain on him, always, you know, involved in this way and that way and this way and that way. John's absolutely excellent at the pads, Russ. He took me on pads once. He's brilliant at it. But what my point is, Russ, is that it all ended up how Brendan wanted it to end up anyway, where Dominic's in a stable career, making waves and doing his fair share. John's doing his fair share. And Brendan was satisfied with where his other kids were, even though it weren't inboxing. But for years, Russ, when things weren't as obviously going to work as, as good as what they did turn out to be, yeah. he said, he goes, Richard, he goes, no one were with me. He goes, I was a laughing stock. He goes, and, you know, I were, I were labouring, I were going to work. He goes, and, you know, I were, I, were, I were enjoying what I were doing. He goes, but, he goes, but after, after obviously a few years of um, commitment and having people walk through the door like Errol Bomber Graham, like uh, Daniel Teasdale, like uh, Ryan Rhodes, Naz, uh, Johnny Nelson, Brian Anderson, which um, yeah, Junior. After all these people walking through the door, he goes, um, he goes, our our um, things started to roll and start to look a bit more obvious, like they were going to be successful and start to come together. Um, he goes, and that's when you know everybody comes out of the woodwork. He goes, family, what I hadn't seen for years had show up. He goes, you know, families of the boxers of Naz. Um, you know, they'd all show up wanting to train and they'd be training and gym were packed. He goes, uh, when Naz became champion, obviously, David Beckham came into the gym at uh, his, his height of success. And 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 that's the that's the beautiful side of, of boxing, Russ. You know, knowing that, 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 that there's such value in developing human beings. One of the things that I give Brendan so much credit for, Russ, is that he didn't, he didn't have anybody to take example from like I have got Brendan. He didn't really have anybody to fall back on. It was just his passion. He just loved giving to children and people that needed it, Russ. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's... and Sorry, sorry, Russ. No problem. And, and that's, the, that's the beautiful side of... Bo- that's the side of boxing that, you know... Um, I appreciate that's the side of uh, people that I appreciate. So when when I do, you know, get you know little things pop up like like that that like Johnny interview, and I'm not just digging Johnny out, but like that interview with Johnny, you know, digging Deontay out, and every uh, what what seems to be like every opportunity, you know, dis- just disrespecting uh, Deontay, just being so disrespectful as to yeah yeah, well you know he did this and talking about his suit and did this, just just not even taking into consideration where where he might be at mentally and what it might have done to him. Even though Johnny's been through it, you know, I just found, I just, I don't like that side of it. And I don't like that side of people that, you know, that do these, because it's called slanderous. And it's one of the biggest sins in, in, in all, the, all the religious books, whether you're Muslim, Catholic or Christian or, or Jewish or whatever. Slander is a sin. But anyway... Um, so that's what I took from Brendan. What I took from Adam is his masterful brain. Yeah. He's so good. He's so eloquent at describing things. 
he's got such a giving heart. Um, he's created a mass amount of wealth through connections, obviously through boxing in no particular order, through through developing fighters to be the best they can be. Adam's made a good, good, good living, and and rightly so because he's one of the most beautiful characters you could ever meet. Russ, he will give you if he's got a pound in his pocket, he'll give you he'll give you seventy pence. If he's got, um, if I will live him with him, his two babies and his wife for for nearly two years. Russ, that that says well, no, in fact, nearly three and a half years. That that says everything about the man. You know, and he didn't know me. All he knew of me was I was this kid from Sheffield. What come down to spar with David, the for Titan Fury fight. Uh, I was polite. I'd been in prison, and just as I as I am now, now Russ, I were up and flipping people phoning me. I never get as many phone calls, Russ. Um, but but yeah, um, just as just as I am now, Russ, I've always been open. So that's all Adam really knew about me. He took me under his wing and taught me so much, just not only about um, the compassionate side of boxing, but about the business side of boxing, about, you know, the, the, the intellectual side of boxing and the intellectual side of um, managing and promoting and just showed me so much. And, and, and that's what I got from Adam. What I got from Emmanuel was, you know, his, his ability to spot what somebody need to, needed to improve on, what, what they needed to work on to develop this and to develop that. And I know um, Emmanuel's appreciation for tall people. He, he, he could bring the best out of a tall person, someone with long levers, someone with, you know, a, a tall stature. He'd, he'd, he'd bring the best out of that person particular for that particular uh, style or stance or posture, whatever you want to call it, Russ, yeah. um, and and uh, and how he demanded respect, because Vladimir really, really respected him, and 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 Emmanuel didn't take no shit from anybody, yeah. um, including including Vladimir, and and reason why I said that, Russ, is because, Russ, is because um, not many people realise how famous Vladimir and Vitali actually are in Germany. Are they massive? Oh, are they massive over there? Oh, they're absolutely massive, Russ, and um, and and that's what not many people uh, understand. But obviously, at the height of their success, I was obviously in the mix, and I was there, and I was spending a lot of time there, and with them, and and listening to them, talking to them, and just picking up on that environment. Russ, what's he amazing. like? What's he like, Vladimir, to get on with? Uh, Vladimir's Vladimir's a really really good guy, Russ. You know. Um, he's just he's not like us Russ he's a little bit of a geek you can see that um, he, he was, were, he were, he's, he's been disciplined to, to study he's been disciplined to uh, learn a good work ethic um, he's very very formal uh, but but he's got a nice personality Russ he's a father now um, and, and to be honest with you I can't ever say that any aspiring partners were neglected it were quite the opposite, Russ. You know, some of sparring partners from America, in particular. You know, they'd come from ghettos over there, and they'd be like, "Whoa, this is paradise!" <laughs> they'd be walking about with, um, with with towels on in in seven star um, Stanglework, <laughs> non Stanglework non bio uh, bio hotel. They'd be walking about in Stanglework with 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 no boxer shorts on underneath the towels, and you know, <laughs> swinging. The, um, but but Vladimir Vladimir is a gentleman. I can't say anything bad about the fella. To be honest with you, Russ, he's a geek, and there were a lot of times where uh, he'd be talking or cracking jokes, and I'd just think that weren't funny. You know, all other spine point would be like, ha, 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 and I'd just be like, he used to do Borat, didn't he, all the time, didn't he, around you, didn't he? Yeah, that used to fucking do me head. He was like, I think it, it weren't funny the first time, pal. Uh, don't do it again. <laughs> no, thank you. They used to come uh, up to you. Again. Did he used to come up to you and pretend to be Borat? <laughs> yeah, he'd just be like, uh, we'd just be talking and he'd go, I'd go, yeah, yes, Vladimir, how you doing, man? i go, looking good, man, and um, this place is beautiful. Thanks for inviting us, man. I'm truly appreciative. I, I just wanted to let you know that. And, you know, if you feel me staring at you, it's because I'm I'm trying to learn from you, champ. And he'd be like, yes, very nice, very nice. And I'd go, 
yeah, yeah. I go, <laughs> and he go, it's it's very good. Uh, uh, it's very good. It's very nice. And I'm like, eh? is this guy like taking piss or something? But he weren't. He would just he, that was just his personality, just have a crack in a joke type thing. Yeah. Um, but I actually made friends with uh, Vladimir's um, his his bodyguard, who's a fella called Rustam. He's a very close friend of mine now. Uh, he's a he's a Ukrainian commando, yeah. and um, so I made a lot a lot of connections and people that I'm still in contact with now. Russ and you know everything the path that I've been on, I didn't earn no money out of it with the boxing side of things. I didn't earn no money out of it, but I, I'm just so grateful for the difference in experiences and meeting the differences in people and 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 just as I was when I first started Russ, I'm even more morally challenged these days by not only the knowledge but by seeing you know the people that not even success but just the suggestion of success bring yeah. it brings things out in people and I just think to myself I think you know what Russ I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of glad that I'm involved with boxing from an arm's length position um while I pick up on and try and you know become be a be a little bit more uh, tolerant of people um but I'm kind of glad that I can see people for what they are us because mm. one one of the things that you've got to give a lot of people most people in boxing is they scrub up well Russ and when they're on TV and they're smiling and they're doing all that and being nice they come across they come across like really really good people they come across like really really nice people but I'll tell you what Russ there's some pieces of shit in boxing I'll tell you bro I'll tell you that yeah, you know Vladimir. The uh, well, I, I've been told when they go out and that they have like NATO security if they're going into other, you know, like Eastern Bloc areas, you know, Bulgaria and Russia and stuff like. That. They always have like people with guns and that escorting them, don't they, off airports and stuff like that. I didn't realize they were that. I didn't realize they were that big. You know, as stars, him and his brother. Yeah, Russ. What? So what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna send you a, a video of what Rustam sent me. So Rustam's Vladimir and, and Vital is. Uh, yeah. Close, close protection guy. Yeah. yeah, he's a Ukrainian commando, Russ. Right. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you one of his training videos. Yeah. Don't we just stick it on the end of this video when it's all jazzed up? Yeah. Yeah. Put it on. Put it on if you want, Russ. I'll send it you now. Yeah, send it me now. Yeah, go on. Wait one minute. Wait, and I tell you, Russ, this guy is a weapon. And uh, it's a weapon. <laughs> yeah, and it literally. <laughs> <laughs> and just just such a such an unassuming guy russ but but my gosh what well just what watch watch the danger this guy's dangerous man and um i've sent me through russ yeah one's come two's come both come through now russ nice one uh moving on then to cash alley what uh would you think? Would you do you think his career sort of stuttered a bit in the last eighteen months? We, we, yeah, not to me. Sorry, Russ. Do you think Cash's career stuttered a little bit since he won Area Bell? Yeah, I, I don't think it's since since then, Russ. I think with regard, it's been a contribution of every everything, including Cash's dad um, dying. Yeah. Sorry. His dad died, didn't he? And that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one big thing, obviously, but I weren't going to say that. What I was yeah. going to say, Russ, is um, it's been a contribution of different things, including Cash's, um, Cash's neglecting of training, of, you know, taking boxing seriously, because before Cash came to me, he can't have took anything seriously, because he, he weren't in shape, he weren't... The, the things that we're going through now when he's starting to get Russ... It not even it had not even been spoke to him about it before, you know. So, um, Cash Cash has only just started taking this this boxing thing seriously. So yeah, he's definitely his career has definitely been stuttered. But um, I think Cash will take responsibility to say, you know, I've 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 wasted a lot of time just messing around and you know, um, not 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 doing what I should have been doing. And now that me and Richard are together and um, we're doing what we're doing. I realised what I should have been doing all this time, and um, the, Cash has got a has got an advantage because 
he's only he's only 28 Russ and for a heavyweight uh, a seasoned heavyweight because he's had he's had an 18 fights um he's a way sparring now in Devon but uh, it's just it's in what just formed me actually but um but cash is on it now Russ he's on it and um and he'll give anybody a, anybody a decent fight and they'll know they've been in a fight if cash has been in with them but it's just words in it Russ and people will probably watch this and go ah cash Ale, that fellow what bit people you know come on man flipping heck nobody ever done anything wrong in the life and what what they regret you know cash is on the ball now he's doing good and um and and the the future's bright Russ all right then that's good uh, all right then. Well, listen. Thanks for coming on, Richard. It's been a pleasure. Sorry for the ranting, Russ. No, don't worry about this. I do that every day. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Listen, it'll drive you out, Ben. This one, this game. <laughs> yeah, oh, if you let it, Russ, I promise you. Rules are designed for everybody to fall out, aren't they? <laughs> well, 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 well. The thing, the thing is, Russ. It's not. You can't blame it on rules. What, what you have to, what you have to look at is, you know, you'd think that. Uh, a sport of such bravery, such you know, uh, valiant, valiant you know, people and you know capabilities. You'd think that there'd be a lot more honourability in boxing, but the fact is, Russ, that you know you, you you've got you've got not a lot of smart people, not a lot of smart fighters. You know, they might think they're smart, but yeah. you know. Not. There's going to be wolves at the door waiting to look, seize an opportunity. So yeah. then you—that's the start. That's one section of it. Then you've got, you know, the the fighters that are putting so much in, laying everything down on the line. Not to mention risking their lives every time they get in ring rust. Not just yeah. fighting, sparring as well. Yeah. You've got these. They get to a stage of desperateness because they're not they're not paid footballers' wages, which you which is commonly known, Russ. They're not yeah. paid footballers' wages. So you've got these people, these brave, lion-hearted souls that are getting to places of desperation. These little rats and wolves that are sat by the wayside waiting to get involved and waiting to take advantage, you know, they become the teachers because they've got something to offer the fighters. So the fighters start to listen to these people. Before they know it, they're pulling little rat dog tricks even though they're not necessarily rat dogs. Yeah. And over time, what's happened is, I heard Billy Joe, Billy, I was speaking to Billy, and, and Billy were explaining about Barry McGuigan. You know, Brendan explained to me about Barry McGuigan from from years and years ago, before I even knew who Barry McGuigan were. Brendan had told me, he said, he's a little rat. He's done, he did brilliant in boxing. But he has got no loyalties, he's got no scruples, he's got no morals. And people are probably hear me saying this and go, who are you to talk? How dare you speak about such a man that's that, that achieves such such accolades and what have you? But I'm not talking about his achievements, I'm not talking about his his career, I'm talking about him as a person. He's supposed to be a piece of shit. And um and and I was speaking to Billy about it, and Billy were you know, just saying, like, just telling me a few things, what I can't repeat, but um, all you have to do is listen to Carl Frampton, Al Carl Frampton. Carl Frampton's a wicked guy. I know him, Russ. He's a top guy, lovely guy. Billy, Billy's a lovely guy as well. As much as, you know, he's mischievous, Billy's a good guy, Russ. And um, and and how they speak about um, Baron McGuigan and, you know, um, Carl Frampton speaks about all the McGuigans being rats and, you know, um, it, it just, it, it's a shame because somebody of such influence and such achievements, like we've just said, turning out to be a rat, it just teaches people that, you know, people coming up, that it's all right to be a rat. If you look at, if you look at people like Richard Poxon, you know, I don't, I don't really know Richard Poxon. Richard Poxon's never really done anything wrong to me, but the things I hear about him, the, the way people talk about him, and the little sly moves I've heard that he's made and this and that and this and that. And you just think to yourself, you think, how dare these people even dare to operate in such a in such a such an industry with such dangerous people? And and they've and they've got nothing to defend themselves, they're completely defenseless. If it did come to the crunch, how dare these people even attempt to to earn a shilling out of a fighter? But 
it's that type of sport, Rich, they do. It's that type of sport, Russ, they do. You get people like Richard Poxon. You get people like, you know, and I, I'm not putting them in the same category, but Baron McGuigan, you get, because Baron McGuigan can fight, could fight, and probably still can fight, um, and and had had balls. You know, I can't say the same about Richard Poxon. Like I say again... You He's know, got one ball, hasn't he? He's got one bollock. I don't know, but I'm just yeah. trying to say to you. Russ, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just oh, trying to say to you. <laughs> oh, you're about balls in general. <laughs> yeah, he's nah, only I'm... got one. <laughs> Sorry, go on. I don't, I don't know about that, Russ. But I'm just trying to say to you that boxing's full. It's full, and I'm the, Richard Poxon just came to the forefront of my mind. I've not thought about him for years, so yeah. don't be mistaken thinking that I sit here dwelling on people like what Johnny Nelson's done with with Deontay and what he's doing, what he's done with you know uh, you know slandering Deontay like he's he has been I'm not I'm not I'm not it don't it don't I don't necessarily think of it that much it's only because I'm speaking to you now Russ it's relevant yeah. to bring it yeah. up yeah but um but like I say Russ boxing I don't need to really explain any further but yeah. boxing is full it's full of wretches and mm. it probably is always going to be full of wretches because there's money involved there's vulnerable, unintelligent people involved, yeah. and there's opportunities involved. Rough. Wherever, wherever those categories are involved, you're always going to get wretches, and um, and that's the unfortunate side of boxing, Russ. The fortunate side of it is what we're doing at gym. We're changing children's lives. What Brendan's been doing for 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 um, generations changing children's lives, developing lives, not only in boxing, but people, uh, Brian Anderson is the head governor of, of, um, of prisons, private prisons, I think it is, but don't quote me on that because I might be wrong. But um, he's got a brilliant job, a brilliant career, and I'm sure he'd say the same thing down to what Brendan did for him through boxing. Do you know? So that's the beautiful side of it. Um, with regards to every, everything else, Russ, um, it's all it's all left to be seen. Whatever's going to happen will happen. Um, but people should know that I am better off left alone. I'm better off just left alone because, yeah, I'm 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 flying straight. I'm I'll always will be straight. And I've I've took a life of being straight now. Uh, I've got um, a handful of kids looking up to me. I've got professional fighters, amateur fighters looking up to me. I've got a big responsibility now. So I am flying straight and, and, I, and I am all right, but just leave me alone. That's all I said to people. Leave me alone and everybody's safe. All right. Well, listen, thanks for, co <laughs> thanks for coming on. That last bit were a joke, Russ. That last I bit know, yeah. Joke. I know, mate. I know. Well, listen, people don't need to get in your way, do they, Rich? So they might come across well, just, that. Well, just, <laughs> why, would, why, would, why would anybody want to get in anybody's way? I know, that's you know, it. Well, that's, I know, yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Well, listen, thanks for coming on. It's been emotional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry to rant, Russ. No I'm problem, not, no problem not... mate. Listen, mate, yeah. you, this is what I'm here for. Listen, you take care. Love to your family and uh, have a great week. What's left of it? Yeah, but I've not, I've not finished ranting yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> All right, then. Well, listen, you take care, Richard. God bless. Cheers, mate. Much respect. Love, love to your family, Russ, yeah? Take care, mate. All the best. See you soon, pal. Cheers, mate. mate. Ladies and gentlemen, hats and promotions sponsored by Hard Rock Cafe Manchester, ViamaxNutrition.com, DirectAssist.info, exclusive on Sky Sports HD Fight Night. Proud to present 12 three minute rounds of boxing for the vacant European Union heavyweight title. The officials have been appointed by the European Boxing Union and the British Boxing Board of Control. EBU Supervisor at ringside, Charles Giles. British Boxing Board of Control, Steward in Charge, Jeff Bolter. 
Timekeeper at the bell, Andrew East. The three scoring judges at ringside are Leszek Jankowiak from Poland, Pierluigi Poppi from Italy, and Adrioni Zanoni from Italy. Finally, when the action commences, the referee in charge of the action. A warm British welcome, please, for Ernst Sochgeber from Austria. Introducing to you firstly, boxing out of the blue corner, wearing the orange colored shorts trimmed with black and silver. At the weigh-in yesterday, he scaled 16 stone, 13 pounds. His record reads 19 contests, 17 wins. 14 of those wins coming by way of knockout with just two defeats. Presenting from San Rafael, France, Gregory, the gentleman, Tony. And opposing him, boxing out of the red corner, wearing the solid black shorts trimmed with white. At the weigh-in yesterday, he scaled 16 stone, 12 pounds. His perfect record reads 13 contests, 13 wins. 10 of those wins coming by way of knockout, presenting from the steel city of Sheffield, the undefeated Richard Inferno Towers. Mr. Saltzgeber with his final instructions. 12 three minute rounds. Yesterday at the weigh-in, Big Richard Towers was smiling and joking and relaxed and saying he was looking forward to the biggest night of his life. Here it is, no smiling and joking now. The game faces on for the big fella from Sheffield, up against the Frenchman Gregory Tony. The EU heavyweight title is on the line. That is not the European title, but it's a stepping stone to joining the big league. And he nearly joined the big league right there with that right hand, which Tony just about saw. They put three judges at ringside for this one. I don't know why they bothered, because these two are both knockout artists. Well, it's good to see Towers up at the, the, the 12 round level. I've liked everything I've seen about him so far, and they have to move him fairly quickly at 32 years of age. But he's certainly taken some chances in the opener here. So just, uh, maybe just. Uh, Find the range before you put the power into the shots. Yes, 10 stoppages in Towers' 13 wins, 14 stoppages in Tony's 17 wins. And Tony has also been bombed out a couple of times. Once, I saw it last year actually, Mike Perez took him outside a round on international prize fighting. It's no disgrace. And uh, Robert Hellenius stopped him in six with this title on the line a couple of years ago. Hellenius went on, of course, to become the European champion briefly. Yeah, but he's only lost in decent company, so he does deserve a little bit of respect. But uh, you know, with the heavyweights, uh, they all feel they have the power to finish it with the one shot, and the uh, Towers is looking for an early finish. Taking charge early, which is good to see, Towers. Tony being very cagey and respectful, which is hardly a surprise. He's a kickboxer as well, he's busy in his native France with the other code. And his record there is, tends to be, you know, either stops his guy or he gets stopped. So it's all or nothing really with the Frenchman, Gregory Tony. Towers has a much more sordid look about his boxing than Tony does. You know, he's setting himself well, just shuffling in. Just trying to get close enough, you can be, you see a little bit obvious with the right hand, you can see him cocking that right hand when he let it go. So Tony knows what's coming. 
So he maybe wants to settle down, just try a few things out. Don't look for power too soon. Yeah, looking to hunt Tony down here, just trying to find the range, pouring out those left jabs. The right hand cocked, waiting for the moment of detonation. So he's not throwing any punches there. Uh, I mean, thankfully, he's not taking anything back, but really, he should be working on the way in. He should be throwing some jabs. You know, break the concentration of Tony. Don't just march in with the, the right hand caught ready for action. Good enough to win the round. Listen, listen. This kid is slow. You sound. Yeah. Apart from when he just fires that fast right hand. So when he's rolling him over the top of the big ones, it's yeah. slow. Take your time. It looks like he's just trying to hit him with that right hand all the time. Yeah. But when you start hitting him with that stiff jab, you're catching him. It's an harder shot. Right. Do Sam. But you've got to, you know what I mean? He's going to try and time and then counter with your right up coming in off yeah. it. You've got to feed him that jab before you before you give it him. And okay. Even if you're leaving it off on him before you go bang. Yeah. But don't just go bum up and then like try and lead off because he's waiting for the counter. Yeah. Well, that's Dominic Sam, Ingle so issuing tight, the instructions there. As you throw it, make sure you've got this hand the Winko Bank <laughs> gym in Sheffield. <laughs> Kel Brook, Richard Stablemate, has uh, made the journey over to Manchester to support his, his teammates, all the good mates. So let's see if there's a little bit more ambition from Gregory Tony in this second round, or whether survival is the name of his game. We'll find out the longer this one goes on. Round two of this battle to be the EU champion of heavyweight of Europe. Yeah, well, Dominic Ingle there, telling Richard Towers there, you know, just don't follow him around, cocking the right hand, it's just a little bit obvious what he has in his mind. So he wants to use that jab, and that's what he started the second round doing. Get some punches off, confuse the guy a little bit, penetrate the defences. Very modest guy about his own abilities, Richard Towers. He talked to him, he says, look, you know, you've got to walk before you can run. He said, I'm not even walking yet, I'm just crawling. Well, it's baby steps after this, I guess, because he will start to move up in class. Tony landed a right hand there as he moved in as well. As you say, everything we've seen about Towers so far, we've liked, but... You would like to see a little bit more work rate from him. I know it's a 12 rounder and he's got to pace himself, but he's not dictating this one. Just looking for power shots, I think. You know, just trying to march forward and do it with one right hand, but really he should be using the jab. I mean, he's allowing Tony to set up the punches here because he's taking so long. That's better. Switch downstairs, left hook, but there's Tony landing another one of those swatting left hands upstairs. Oh, that shot. shook him, that shook him, he felt that one, and takes a knee. Well, the first solid punch that Richard Towers lands forces Tony to take a knee. And that looks real bad news for the Frenchman. So Towers knows he can hurt him, the Frenchman Tony decides, well, I better go for broke here, because this fella gets me like that again, I might not get up. Yeah, I think it's the fact that Tony was showing a little bit of ambition himself, it left him so open. And that was a lovely right hand. But Towers just still wants to settle down, go back to his box and get find the target. Don't worry about the power shots. Just find the range, find the target. That's better, use the left hand. Did land the left hand, got a response from Tony. He hasn't hoisted the white flag. He very sensibly took a knee to let the head clear. Keeping that guard respectfully high and just, just confusing Towers a little bit here. And well, a left hook of his own again, although Towers was sort of drifting away from it, so the power won't have bothered him too much. And there he is trying to get the jab going again, Towers. I mean, Towers is right enough, there's still a lot of things he has to learn. He has to learn to faint against awkward opponents before he throws the punches. He's just been a little bit predictable, but that was a big round for him, obviously, with a knockdown. Well, let's have a look at that right hand. There it is. And the delayed reaction, Tony suddenly thought, oh, I need to take a breather. Yep, well, that's a sign of a good shot. I mean, he still had his senses about him, but he felt that all the way down to his boots. 
So the sensible thing to do, couldn't afford to take another one. So the fact that he took the knee showed that his thinking was still in order. He knew what he was about and he made the right choice there. That was a beautiful shot. And I think Towers is just too keen to land the right hand. That worked that time, but it has to, to change things about a little bit, relax a little Goals bit, and try to, to use some skills. Second out, round three. Round three of this 12-round battle for the heavyweight EU title, a title given up by Robert Hellenius. It's also been held by the likes of Stefan Nielsen, the Dane, and uh, Michael Sprott. It's a stepping stone to what they hope is big things for the winner. It puts him into the top ten in Europe. And Richard Towers, the man in black, the, the latest in this generation of skyscraper British heavyweights that we seem to have all over the place at the moment, looking to make his first real impact on the heavyweight scene. Decent straight right hand from Tony. It's better he switched that jab around Towers, just converted it into a little hook. So again, just uh, being you know, obvious what his intentions are, Towers. And he does get caught by those right hands over the top every so often. Tony's landed two or three of those now, and Towers has taken them well. But that's something they'll want to work on when they get him back to the Winko Bank, Jim in Sheffield. You get tagged by a big hitter like that, it's going to be trouble. Well, Tony hasn't shown the power to trouble Towers. Towers, but when you're up at heavyweight, you can't afford to take chances. And they all say that, don't they? All the big fellas. They all say it one punch, that's all it takes. It's becoming a little bit messy. And that'll suit Tony. Towers misses with the right hand. Follows up with a nice little left hook. Tony looks to try and engage as well, but Tony's definitely here to spoil and maul and just frustrate as much as he possibly can. And hope to land the big right hand himself. Just in a few little instances where you get the feeling that Tony knows a few tricks of his own. You know, he makes Towers miss, then he gets him back into position to come back with counters. A little bit of blood from, from the nose of Towers as well, nothing that uh, should trouble him too much, you wouldn't have thought. Yeah, I think uh, Tony is an awkward opponent. Uh, I think Towers is struggling a little bit with that awkwardness. And the thing that really jumps out at you, and I think you alluded to this earlier, Jim, there's no rhythm at the moment in Richard Towers' work. He's looking for those big right hands, but it, 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 it's kind of a, his thinking is his, his, his way through this at the moment, and just getting caught with a little uppercut there as well. This has not been a good round for big Richard Towers. Certainly more variety coming from the Frenchman here. Yeah, Towers is still thinking too much about the power shots. Yeah, it didn't really produce much in that round. And you saw the shake of the head as he went back to his corner. You've just dropped this kid, do you understand? Yeah. All the kid's doing is fiddling you around. Yeah. All right, deep breathe, and, all, and you're getting a bit frustrated and trying to land big shots. Yeah. Deep breathe. Just get your jab working. Yeah. Dominic Ingle spot <laughs> on with his analysis. That's all you got to do. Do you understand? You're also getting negative. You have no reason. You're winning every round and you've dropped him. Yeah. All right. Meanwhile, in the other That's corner. Well, they won't be too unhappy with how that last round yeah. unfolded. No, well, his awkwardness, I think, paid some dividends in the previous round. Uh, Towers posed and threatened, but didn't really do an awful lot. Second out, round four. Round four of this 12-rounder, Richard Towers from Sheffield, up on his feet quickly against Gregory Tony from San Rafael in France. Towers has forced Tony to take a knee, which he very wisely did after, land, after a big right hand landed. But he's not really been able to build on that, the big fella. My big fear at this stage, I know it's early days, but my big fear is that uh, Tony can last the pace better than Towers. 
Towers is winding up the power shots, and when you're missing with the power shots, it empties the tank. So I feel he should be trying to bring some boxing ability to the table, forget the power until he starts landing cleanly. But this guy is awkward to deal with. And they landed a nice right to the body there. Towers has to try and respond with a jab. There's another right hand to the body from Tony, and they get tied up again. Easy to forget as well that Towers is a novice still. He had a minimal amateur career coming virtually to speak of. And this is his only four, or only his 14th pro fight. And a lot of those have gone very, very early. There's another right hand to the body. Tony finding consistent success with that shot in this round. Towers has to find a way to relax. He looks a little bit tense, he's winding up the big punches. And he's just a bit too predictable. Tony looking for that right hook to the body once again. Towers throws a wild right hand and then shows some elusive skills, which he needed. But again, Tony just picking him off. The better work in this round is coming from the Frenchman. Yep, another round where so far Towers is threatening, but not really producing. Come on, he's knackered this week. He's working. Come on, he's very low. Looks to land a little right there, though. Tony is starting to find his range. Now that's a little bit better from Towers, getting a response now at last from the Sheffield man. And what's not been a good round for him. Well, there hasn't really been an awful lot of quality in this round, I'm afraid. But the towers, you know, it's the same idea coming forward with the right hand caught, looking for the power shot. It's a little scuffling punches coming back from Tony. It's interesting for me that Tony had such success with the rights downstairs. He seems to have gone away from that the longer the round has gone on. And now Towers looks to try and get that left jab going. All of these big fellas with the long arms. So much of their work flows off that left jab. You saw what David Price did with his left jab against Sam Sexton. Set up everything. Towers struggling to find anything really with that jab at all. Shut up. There's nothing wrong with you. Right? Yeah. That's not what I'm telling you. Uh -huh. Stick to your boxing. There's yeah. nothing wrong with you. This kid's just fiddling around his this and his bollocks. Yeah. All he's doing is it's like guerrilla warfare. He's hitting you I think the awkwardness of Tony is beginning to get. To Towers. Towers hasn't been asked to deal with this kind of opponent before. And he's still winding up the power shots. And just uh, not. That was a decent jab, probably the best punch of the round from Towers. But we need to see more of that. I felt right from the opener, we should be using that jab. Well, I think when that big right hand landed and he took the knee in the second round, they might have been very concerned in that corner. Clouds are lifting, and there's a, a sense that they might be able to do something here. Second down, round five. Round five. Richard Towers, the Inferno in the black. A six foot eight man from Sheffield up against Gregory Tony from San Rafael in France. The longer it's gone on, the more you see Towers running out of ideas, and Tony not exactly impressing, but just picking him off with little shots. There's body shots, there's that right hand over the top. And Towers needs to find something just to just to turn the tide back his way and quickly. Yeah, Towers has to try something else, maybe rough the guy up a little bit, maybe use his physical strength. I believe he is physically stronger. But he's just doing the same things. Just edging forward, looking for the right hand. Trying the jab at the beginning of this round. Once again, Tony does what he's been doing pretty much most of the fight, throws a couple of shots and then just gets in close and ties up. And Towers can't shift him. It's wild that Tony unable to capitalise. There's more evidence of just loading up with the big single right hand. Good work again from Tony. A couple of shots getting through and Tony knows 
Well, he might have just hurt Towers a little bit there. Certainly shook him up. This is a good assault from the Frenchman. And Towers not offering anything back and taking punishment. And this is a turn up for the books. Well, that was a really interesting little spell. And Towers is not out of the woods yet. And they sense it in Tony's corner that there's a finish on here. I think Towers is drained at the moment. He looks drained. Can Tony capitalise? Look at you. He got that right hand and it stiffened the knees of Tony. And Richard Towers needed that. And now it's turned into a battle. Because Tony was shaken there and he put a lot of work in but couldn't get rid of Towers. Look at that shit shot from Tony. And they got tangled up on the ropes. Towers again shipping punishment and all over the place. But Tony can't find a decent shot. And Towers, though, looks like he's spent. The legs have turned to rubber. He has he's got nothing left. left. He's absolutely out on his feet, Richard Towers. Tony, three straight shots. Looks for the right hand, and Towers more on exhaustion than anything else. I don't think he's calling a knockdown. He's not calling it. Tony's celebrating. Goodness no. knows why. I think he thought the referee had stopped the fight there. Well, he's not called the knockdown. But he should have done because it was the ropes that kept him up. But Tony continues the assault, and Towers is just soaking it up and soaking it up. And how much more can he take? He is all over the place. The, the, the referee is doing everything he can. Look, you can hardly walk there. The referee has given him every chance to let him to get to the bell. I'm thinking that's going to be a 10 8 round. That must be a 10 8 round. There was only Don't one man in that Richard, round. Richard. Listen, listen, listen to me. Listen to me. Well, that was near catastrophe for Richard Towers. That was a huge round for Gregory Tony. He didn't stop throwing punches. I think the referee did Richard Towers all sorts of favours. I think you can thank the referee the fact that he's still in there. He was drained. He had not a thing left. And Tony poured everything he had. I wonder, I wonder who's going to come back stronger from around like that. That was the big right hand, the only answer that Towers found throughout that round. And it was a beauty. But Tony come back again. And several times it looked as though he was out on his feet. And here, Jim, the ropes. Well, we, we didn't see it there, but the ropes right in front of us. The ropes kept Towers up, and they didn't rule it a knockdown. So I agree with you, Ed Salzgaber gave, gave Richard Towers every chance there, but Tony was dancing around and celebrating a couple of times as well. Goodness knows what that was all about. So now, can Towers find some second wind? He has survived an almighty scare. Is he out of the woods? Tony looking to land another one of those right hands, follows up with the left. Well, I came with the round and decides the fight because uh, did Tony use up too much steam? Or is Towers unable to shake off the effects of those punches and the fatigue and come back into this? It's becoming untidy now. And that's to be expected. Towers is blowing hard as well. He really is. He needs to shorten this up if he can. Let's get those jabs going and try and find one of those right hands to just end this. Well, I think now's the time he has to take some chances, Towers. Put punches together. He's been lining up single shots in every round so far, which haven't been working. There's a little signs at the moment that maybe Tony is taking a lot out of the tank. Yeah, Tony put so much into that last round, and again, the referee rocking him up. And that allows Towers to try and seize the initiative here. There's a right hand gets through. Just missed with the follow-up, but Tony felt that first one. Towers looking to try and find another one of those. Towers just wants to stand off and give him some of the room here. He landed a good right hand. He needs that space to get the punches home. This is a good recovery from Towers. This is good stuff from him. He still looks a bit unsteady on those legs of his, though, Jim. I'm not sure how much he could take if Tony could find another assault. But he's doing the right things now, for the first time. And now Tony's starting to look really tired. These two fellas, I, I think they're both on the edge. Well, Towers is still the one with the power. He's the one who can finish it with one shot. I think we've seen that Tony can't do that. He can't produce that kind of power. Tony looks now exactly like Towers did in the last round, just leaning away, trying to stay out of trouble. He looks like he's ready to go. And then Towers did in the last round, and then Towers dips. There's a right hand that's around the back of the head. Both these fellas. 
They are, I think they're both on the point of exhaustion. One decent shot could get rid of either of them. And now Tony's looking to turn it around. Well, I've always had the feeling that Tony would last the pace better. I wonder if that's going to be the case here. And clubbing one round the back of the head, Tony complained. But the referee this time hasn't stopped it, and now eventually... Well, I don't know what's in this referee's uh, yeah, mind that, that, here, I don't incredible. have a clue. Half the time he's watching the fight instead of refereeing it. Made some crazy decisions. And that was a big punch round the back of the head there. And he just stood back. A much better round for Richard Towers as Tony wobbles unsteadily to his corner. Well, he found that second win. That's his best round round before. You've got him there, right? One round. This kid doing no dying about when he's running over Rob. Do him. Apologies for the language. Hook him round the but side of the face. Dominic Engel knows that Richard That's Towers has done. really dodged this a big one in that last That's round. Him one more round and he's gone. Well, that proves to me that Towers is in terrific shape. Now, that, that shot was round the back of the neck. OK, lack of experience. Tony shouldn't have complained to the referee. But the referee has made some strange, strange decisions, and most of them have benefited Richard Towers. But what a turnaround from Towers. Full credit to him. But as I say, it proves he's got himself into terrific shape because it looked sold out two rounds ago. Well, and just to add to the drama, Jim, while we were watching those replays, Gregory Tony just picked up the towel and threw it into the middle of the ring. And his cornerman retrieved it and brought it back. There he is, he's holding it. Tony doesn't want to know. But he's got to come back out. And is Dominic Ingle right? One more round will do it. But both these fellas look ready to go. Who's going to win this war of attrition? You just cannot take your eyes off this one. It is compelling viewing. Well, the 10 in round. There you go. It had to happen. I was going to say, no point looking at a scorecard. Now, the referees saying that's not a knockdown. But Tony is just so tired now, he could blow him over. Yeah, well, this is where maybe the lack of experience is going to be a problem for Towers. This is where you have to take your time. Keep him at arm's length, don't get too close and get the punches home, but not big single punches that you can see coming. Just mix things up a little bit. And Tony looks to have nothing left. He put so much into that fifth round. There's another punch around the back of the head, which the referee just decides to let go don't let again. Don't let him rest. He take his time, this Austrian referee. Towers still can't get a shot of Tony. Now can the Frenchman try and find a second win? A couple of left hands getting through, then a right. See, Towers doesn't seem capable of throwing short punches, and that's what's needed here, stepping in with a short right hand. But they're all long, full-length punches, and Tony's dealing with them. But this is a good round so far for Towers. He's the one doing the work. Well, if he gets through this, he weathered the most almighty storm, didn't he, Richard Towers? That tells you something about his heart. Because he looked, he looked like he was completely out of it. And then Tony, to give him some credit, as another right hand lands, and he dips again at the knees. He didn't want to know in that last round. He, he's, he's wobbly, he's all over the place as well. But throwing in the towel and then the, the corner taking it back out again. But credit to him, he's come out for some more. And he's trying to pull himself together. So really you're thinking Towers should be able to get this job done. But just lack of experience, it's just there's so much he hasn't learned yet. He looks to have a clear head and the strength back in the legs, which we can't say the same for Tony. Yeah, he does seem to be over the worst. I mean, his legs when he was in the blue corner there, Tony's corner. They have turned to jelly. And it slowed. It was never at a fast pace, but it slowed right down as these two fellas just looked to try and survive. A little jolting punches up close there from Towers. I'm just saying he has to learn to get power into the shorter punches. Another round for Towers, I thought. Well, let's see what happens with the towel this time in the French corner. Honestly, all you've got to do is stick in and this kid will spew it. Both of them just gasping, trying to get some air in the lungs. I think he's very close to 
to the end here, Gregory Tony. <laughs> Well, the body language suggests he doesn't really want to be there. I think this was the, the, the previous round where he threw the, the towel in. Well, that kind of sums it up. But the fact that he's called and have talked him back into it, he survived another round. So he's found the courage from somewhere. But this is it's just the fifth round. I think he just used up far too much team. There's nothing in the tank. But the towers doesn't have the experience to fully capitalise on it. Yeah, the good news for Towers is that whilst he was battered all around the ring in that fifth round, he survived. And Tony put so much into that round. Towers is off his stool very quickly, ready for action. Tony taking at least five or six seconds after that bell sounded and coming out very, very reluctantly and a decent left hook to the body sends him over. And that might be that. I don't think he wants any part of this. Well, he does get up, but his end, Sal's Gabe are going to let him go on. A left hook to the body put him down, so Towers knows where he can hurt him. Tony, to his credit, is coming out firing again. I thought that might have been the end. I wonder maybe uh, if the knockdown was, it was a complaint. I wonder maybe if he thought he was complaining about something. There's nothing wrong with the punch. But the fact that he's got up, you know, <laughs> looking as though he's got ambition. Strange character, this fellow. And he's not, coming back. He might not have much more ambition, though. He took a big right hand and then drops to a knee again. There was a big right hand, and people are booing here, and he's saying that he's got a problem, I think, with one of his arms. He's sending out all kinds of distress flares here. I don't know what's going on. He looked at his corner and was pointing at one of his arms. Is it an elbow problem? Well, they seem to be OK. So Towers has him down twice in this round. You'd have thought one more hurtful punch, and Tony might just say, I've had enough of this. Well, when a fighter wants out of a fight, you've got to get him out of the fight, so the corner really shouldn't be sending this fellow back up again. He's made it clear he doesn't want to be there. He's been on the floor twice in this round. There's nothing left in the tank. Well, every so often, uh, there's just a little flash of defiance, and then he gets towers, and now it's turned around again. Well... There's no way you'd ever call this a classic, but in, the, in its own way, this is one of the most absorbing heavyweight fights you'll, you, you'll ever see. It's just swinging one way than the other. There's a right to the body. Tony felt that and just clings on for dear life. I mean, it's amazing that Towers hasn't finished this job as yet. Incredible that Tony is still upright, still firing back. What a show of courage, because the fellow doesn't even want to be there. Minute of this round. Towers pacing himself. There's another right hand, and the ropes kept him up again. And then he says, "You know what? I need the knee." Yes, but he has to call this well, off. It, it, has to call it off. It's now turning farcical. It was the ropes that kept him up. And then he's decided. Then, well, I'm, I'm going to take a knee. So down three times. Can Towers finally get this job done? Surely one more. Well, we said that before. Have a look at a 10 6 round here. You would think maybe the corner should be thinking about pulling him out now. He's made it clear to them what he wants. Surely one more knockdown if there's time. That was a good shot, but would you believe it? One of the better shots that he's thrown, and Tony took it. And somehow gets through. Well, we've seen everything in this one. What else is there we've got to see? A lot of blood from the nose of Richard Towers, but that is a very, very unhappy French quarter as well. Well, he's complaining about an injury to his arm, so that's another thing. But they're giving him water, they're getting ready to send him back up again. I do not understand this. I'm sure he's telling them, I don't speak the language, but I'm sure he's telling them he doesn't want to go back out. He's telling them his arm. They must pull him out of there. But Jimmy's had his own opportunities. When he went down from that body shot, all he had to do was stay down, and that would have been it. There's, there's, there's something going on with him. There is some desire still there. Yeah, but, I mean, it's a natural pride and courage of a boxer. So when a fighter doesn't want to be there, you've got to get him out of there. If something, but we're talking about heavyweight punches here. If something were to happen here, these guys would never be able to forgive themselves. Round nine, Tony. Again, taking a long, long time to get off his stool. Towers ready for him. What on earth are we going to see in this round? Towers looking for the early right hand. Tony backed up. Body shot 
off target. Towers picking his shots cleanly now. And then catching a little uppercut, and then Tony flicking out a couple of left jabs, so still some ambition there. Well, Tony again showing he can force himself into battle. And then complaining oh, no, no, again. Here he goes again with, what with, more with the did he need in that corner? <laughs> I, I don't know what he's complaining about. I have no it's idea, elbow, and I think he's finally said that's enough. He's pulled himself out. You what know, a bizarre fight that was. You know, that, that corner should be totally ashamed of themselves. That man has wanted out of there, he's given his all. He's put up a terrific show. For three rounds, he's wanted out of there, and that corner refused to get him out of there. He threw the towel on himself. He had everything he couldn't have made it. He, no, his mind any clearer, his thoughts any clearer, they wouldn't get him out of there, and at the end up, he had to go to the referee and tell him, I'm out of here. Disgraceful. But I tell you, full credit to Richard Towers, because he to show a lot of courage and a lot of resilience tonight. He come back from almost being KO'd, KO'd himself all over the place for a full round. So he turned around, so he shows he certainly has the qualities for this business, but he has an awful lot to learn. Yeah, it said a lot that he managed to recover from that fifth round but Dominic Ingle I think they're absolutely right that he's still got some learning to do and there he is he's just waving the arm around just trying to say look I've got a, I've got I've got a torn muscle or something and the referee still trying to say box on still trying to talk him into taking more punches what has gone on tonight I've never seen anything like this it was it was a bizarre one no question about it but the bottom line is Richard Towers escapes with the verdict and more significantly is now the EU heavyweight champion Ladies and gentlemen, after 48 seconds of round number nine, your winner by way of TKO, and he is the new European Union heavyweight champion from Sheffield, Richard Inferno Towers. Let's go! Boxing out of the red corner, wearing the black shorts trimmed with silver. At the weight he scales, 16 stone, 12 pounds. His perfect record reads this evening 12 contests, 12 wins. Nine of those wins coming by way of knockout. Presenting here from his home city of Sheffield, Richard Inferno Towers. Timekeeper at the bell, Barry Pinder from Sheffield. And the star referee in charge of the action, Mr. Howard Foster from Doncaster, eight three minute rounds. Okay lads, keep it clean. Drink straight away when told. Both of you watch your heads in close. Good luck to you both, touch gloves. Good luck lads. Seconds out, round one. It's a heavyweight contest scheduled for eight rounds between Richard Towers in the black shorts and Harold Scogne in the blue and white. Towers from Sheffield in his 13th professional fight, 12 fights, 12 wins so far, nine by knockout. And how important, Glenn, is it for him to impress tonight? I think, you know, as he progresses in the heavyweight division, it's always important, you know, some good opportunities out there. Everybody's looking for the, the next good heavyweight. Towers is starting to, to look good though. He's using his jab well and you know making good progress. For something that's really pretty inexperienced. Scognier, 35 years old from Clearwater, Florida, 43 fights, has lost more than he's won, but he knows his way around the ring. Been a professional since November 1996. Towers looking to come forward with that jab. And then throws the right. Carlton Promotions were hoping that he'd be fighting for a title this evening. He's nominated to box German fighter Mike Wallace for the vacant European Union heavyweight championship. But he picked up a virus in warm weather training. And manager John Ingle told them he'd only be fit for an eight rounder. Oh. 
Suspenio is one of those opponents. I think Teros has to try and hit and hurt pretty early. Might not fancy the job then. He's been stopped 10 times inside schedule. And I think if Taos could land and hurt him early, he wouldn't fancy it. But if he gets in it, he can take decent fighters the, the distance. I'll point to Jamil McCline in his last fight in February. He's six foot six. He's been sparring a six foot seven MMA fighter in preparation for this. He says that he doesn't particularly enjoy fighting the big men, but that he seems to end up put up against them. He's caught with a left hand there. Towers goes to the body. Just picking up the pace there, Towers, and that was good. That got the, the negative reaction from Scogne. And it's really down to Towers just to be determined and really start to put the pressure on Scogne a little bit, make it tough for him early on. It's a good right uppercut. It's a punch that he really does like, as you said, taking that chin behind his shoulder, works off his jab, but does look to get that one away when he can. Okay, he's got to be a little careful as he ups in level. Towers with that left hand carried so low. If he does, he's got to tuck that chin a little bit more behind the shoulder if he's going to continue like that. Good work from Towers in the first round. Slow, deep in right, Listen, you know he's popping that jab out. Just yeah. fencing this step. Is he jab? Boom, straight on the jab. Okay. He's, he's, blocking, he's blocking his jab like that. Yeah. So sticking with jab, as he leads off, boom, right under. Because he's waiting for right hand every time. He's waiting okay. for right hand to yeah. launch. And he's pulling back away from it. Understand? And he's waiting. When you see little cuts straight in front of him, Well, it was a comfortable enough start from Towers. He picked it up at one point in the round. He's troubled Scogne for a little while. Forced to retreat as Towers picked his punches. And this good solid right hand went in there. So he's picking his punch as well. He's obviously relaxed in the, the opening round, managing to find a good variety of punches. Into the second. Advice from Dominic Ingle for Richard Towers between rounds there was to pop that jab out and then look for that right uppercut. Scogne is on for it pretty much every time. He tried it there, but Scogne had just taken a couple of backward steps, but he's getting picked off here, the American. Well, there was the right hand, trouble Scogne. A little short one to the temple. It's come back a little bit now, but I think it's it's really down to Towers to press his authority. You know, push Scogne back on the back foot, keep powering in some big right hands and some uppercuts. Trying to whip that right uppercut in that Dom Dominic Ingle was asking for, but it's the jab, the solid punch, and then the right hand over the top, which he looks open for. For me. Scogne hasn't shown a great deal going forward himself so far. He did take Donovan Razor Ruddock to a split decision. A fight that he says he won. And that was ten years ago or so now. Just want to see a little bit more authority from Towers. Scogne doesn't look as if he's got a lot to trouble him, so it's really down to Towers to make a bit of an impression, make some a statement in there. Nine wins by stoppage for Towers, eight of them inside three rounds. He's yet really to demonstrate the kind of devastating one-punch power that we've seen from the likes of David Price. Yeah, there's only one of his last ten went the distance, though, for Towers, so, you know, he's getting them out of there. Let's see a little more devil in his work here, though. Given that he did pick up that virus away in Lanzarote, could stamina be an issue here? Might he be thinking that he can't start too quickly? Yeah, maybe, you know, depending on how he's feeling. But, you know, to take the fight, he should be feeling in top form. Obviously, you know, inexperience is a big one for Towers. 
he needs to feel his way into a fight where sometimes, you know, when he's got a bit more experience, he can just go out there and let the punches go. And I think that's what it really takes against uh, an opponent like Sonia. He jabs a good one from Towers, but he needs to follow up with that straight right hand. Misses with a bit of a wild overhand right. We saw that one from the, the back of the hall. That was better though, a short chopping right hand. Right at the end of round two. Towel. Right, you're just slightly out of range because yeah. he's pulling back. You understand? And yeah. you're whipping, don't whip that big up from stood away. You've got to step in with that up. Deep right, breath. Yeah. Come on, deep breath. Right up. Big deep breath. Listen. He's, he's just scuffing him on ends because he's just pulling back every time. When you do, yeah. you've got to boom, you've got to just half escape. You know, so you've got to boom, boom, bang. That's what you've got to do with that man. Right. Try to push him back. He's got a long, long Scania reach. sucking so in the air in his corner. Stay distance. He's really Tom McIngall just he telling Richard Towers, as you heard, that okay. Okay. he hadn't you quite found his range yes. in that second yes. round. Yeah, throw that right from his hip. He needs to throw it from the shoulder, just shorten it up a little bit. It's a bit too long, and that's why he's not getting the effect that he needs. Into the third. To that advice from Dominic Ingle between rounds. Towers may be looking just to close the gap a little bit in this third round. Make sure that jab finds its target, and it has done a couple of times there already. He is much the taller man at six foot eight. Scogne, six foot two and a half. Got a stone weight advantage as well, just over. The towers is tall, but he's putting a lot of his weight on his back foot, so he's not getting the full power behind his, his punches on the attack. And then, you know, even leaning back, he's making himself over the punches. He's got to put his weight on the front foot, where the, the power will come then. And you get much more into it. Well, his last fight, a three-round win against Belarusian Yuri Bahutsu, that was here in September. Bahutsu, prior to that fight, was unbeaten, but Royal Cats came into the fight a little out of shape, 33 pounds, heavier than Towers. Well, he's fighting this one. This, you know, it just reminds me a little bit of a sparring session where he's thinking about it a bit too much. He needs to show, you know, a little more authority, a bit snap, you know, grip those teeth and just put a bit more into those punches. He has had some, had some high quality sparring as well. Tyson Fury and Derek Chisora in the past. He'll be sparring Sam Sexton in the build up to his fight with David Price. The answer on May the 19th. Good right hand went in there, really rocked the head back, but he needed to follow that punch in. Another flicking right hand, and this is better now. But Sonia in a bit of trouble, needs to keep the, the punches going in. Nothing coming back from the American. Shaky on his feet there as well, he's putting the combinations together almost at will here, Towers. If he can just sustain this kind of pressure. Shorter punches catching him again there, the right uppercut. Clubbing left hands. Does seem to have found his range in this third, as Dominic Ingle was talking about. He was up close there where he was having most joy, just caught with a left hand, bit of a warning shot. He just stood off, which he shouldn't do. That's not a good sign from Towers, needs to get back, be positive, let the punches go. Sonia looks ready for the taking for me. Good barrage of punches, I think, would finish the job here. We well, won't have time to do it in this round. And it's been very, very strong stuff from Richard Towers in the final minute or so of round three. Do the sand. So you got to deep breathe, deep breathe, slow it down, big deep breath. You've got to go bump one shot, do the sand. Yeah. And listen, when you're up there, like, 
Right, he can take it to him. He's had him wobbling on his feet three or four times. You understand? You've got to capitalise. When you're doing that, he's got his elbow. You've got to whack that body shot in, especially right. in the hole. The, the jab, just got the distance right, and then the, the right hand. He was in a bit of trouble there. Skonye. But for me, Towers just let him off the hook a little bit. His inexperience showed when he had his man ready for the taking. Yeah, solid right hand. The legs went all over the place there and that looked the point where oh, really a barrage of punches would have had Harold Scogne out. Sends out, round four. Into the fourth, and again he flicks out that jab immediately and landed within seconds of that bell sounding. Seems to be growing in confidence here Richard Towers. We spoke earlier Glenn of his lack of amateur experience just Eight bouts, he won six of those. It's just his 13th professional fight. He's got the eight, 65 amateur bouts, 43 professional fights. Again, a left uppercut this time, followed by a right. And it's when he gets in just that little bit closer, as he did in the previous round, that he does some damage. Oh, first to keep a look at Scogne. It's not good to see an opponent's head roll about like that after a, a punch but Towers just taking a bit too much time and what he needs here is really up the pace, make a statement. Gone, gone, gone. Look at his opponents, Towers. He again pins Scogne back, Scogne managing to evade those left to right hands. His last six have been from all over the place, really. Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Brazil, Belarus, Belgium. If you're unfamiliar with the British heavyweight scene, then you might think that there really wasn't all that much going on, but the fact is there is. The likes of Price and Sexton, John McDermott's kept going after that brutal knockout in the hands of Price. Skelton showed us what he can still do against Tom Dallas a couple of weeks ago. Does he need to step up? Yeah, I think he does. I don't think opponents like this are really doing a, the world of good. They've got to be a little careful because he is very inexperienced, but he's a big guy, he's got power. But he's not impressing here for me with an opponent who looks really ready to go. The referee's taking a careful look at Scogne, but he hasn't got the urgency towers. Now, he's going to need that if he's to progress. To the final minutes of the fourth, getting near the halfway stage of the fight. Again, landing with the left and then the right. Now he's got him where he wants him, really. 45 seconds left in the round if he goes to work here. But nothing really come back of anything in return from Scogne. I think his better days were a long way, way ago. If there were any real better days for Harold Scogne. Well, he's been around long enough, that's for sure. 16 fights to he is as a professional. He really felt that one, though. That right hand rocks him down to his boots. A little shake of the head, but that wasn't fooling anybody. Again, a little bit disappointed by the reaction from Towers. But a strong finish to the fourth. Just make him miss. Don't let him catch you flush like That's this. That's the one thing okay. he doesn't seem to be okay. able to do. Yeah. Okay. Make him miss. He's blowing pretty hard in there. Yeah. Well, it's all one-way traffic. Good left uppercut. Doing everything right. Towers, just a, a lack of urgency. He's not really, for me, seeing, you know, how gone Scogne is. And he's letting them hang around, and that's just, you know, taking away any shine from the performance of Towers. And when you throw your notes, don't just throw a straight up. You've got to throw it off a jab, bum bang. Come on, round five. Round five. Into the second half of this fight, scheduled for eight at heavyweight between Richard Towers, the Inferno, and the black shorts, and Harold Scogne, 
35 year old from Clearwater, Florida, in the blue and white. Towers has dominated so far, has had Scogne in trouble two or three times, but hasn't managed to close the show just yet. Detailed advice from Dominic Ingle, as always, and this time he is down, a combination of punches. Scogne grimaces in pain. Richard Towers claims a 13th professional win. Very quickly into round five. Goes over to make sure that Scogne is OK. He looked ready to go on two or three occasions before that, didn't he, Glenn? And he finished that very quickly at the start of the fifth. Yeah, the finish was good when he finally got it at the beginning of the fifth. He came out with a bit more urgency. I think Dominic Ingle had asked for that, and that's all that was really lacking. Scogne was just ready for the taking. He delayed it a little bit longer than I would like to have seen. I'd like to have seen that little, that, that hunger in his, in his performance, but he got the job done. Body punch, weakened Scogne up. He goes back there, the hands come down, and solid right hand, and the, ready, the referee was ready to call that one off. The tenth win now, by way of knockout. Richard Towers in front of his home crowd in Sheffield. Solid right hand to finish it. Well, it's an expectant crowd in here, that's for sure. 1,700 tickets have been sold. They've come to see their own, and one of them has delivered. Ladies and gentlemen, after 27 seconds of round number five, star referee Mr. Foster has stopped the contest. In his opinion, Harold Sconier was in no position to continue. Therefore, your winner, now undefeated in 13 professional contests, here from his home city of Sheffield, Richard Inferno Towers. You liked that one, didn't you? Right, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for liking and subscribing. It means a lot to me. Because uh, we're on this journey together, aren't we? So, anybody got any ideas for the channel, fire them over to me. PorkyCorner at mail.com. Alright? Shout out to Innovation Alloys and South Yorkshire Packaging. Alright? Don't forget to subscribe, keep on trucking.